we are on the, the very bottom of the Afsama Hamid Beis, and we, the Gemara had been discussing the opinion of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who talks about the permissibility of a Kohen marrying a, a Gioris who was Megayer under the age of three. So because of that, the Gemara launches into another opinion of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, which is, Omer, Kivrei Ovdei Kochavim Enon Metamen Ba'ohel, that a Gentile corpse does not transmit tuma in an enclosed area, in an ohel. This has very important ramifications, la halacha, because for kohanim today, who have to worry about tuma, what if there is a corpse, a Gentile corpse in a building, like a hospital, or like the science museum, where they have um, human remains on display. So it's not metame. As a general rule, we are machmir on this halacha, unless there is a pressing need. So for if there's no need for a kohen to enter into a building other than entertainment purposes, so then we say, no, you should not enter. But really, you can be somech when there's a need on this psak of Shimon Bar Yochai that a Gentile corpse does not transmit tuma. Shinamar, and how do we know this? Vo'etein soni tson mar isi adamatem. That Yechezkel says that I will place my flock, that you, my flock, the Jewish people, are called Adam. And from here we learn, Atem kruyin Adam ve'in ha'ovdei kolchavim kruyin Adam. That heathens are not called Adam, only the Jewish people are. Now what that means is, is because we know that in the, discussing the laws of Tumah in an Ohel, the Torah says, Adam ki yamut ba'ohel. That when, a, and when an Adam dies in an, in an enclosure, so from here we learn that you have to be an Adam in order to tra- transmit tuma in an enclosure, and since Gentiles are not called Adam, they don't transmit that tuma. When it's of the Kochavim, does it mean specifically idol worshippers or any non-Jews? Usually the context, it, it depends on the context, but under most circumstances in the Gemara, the context is all non-Jews. So the Gemara now says, Mesve, right, and, but, but by the way, Tosfus discusses this very issue, what about a righteous Gentile? Does he is he called Adam? Mm-hmm. You know, so that's a it's a whole long discussion over here. Adam that's, that's not talking about just Jews. Right? Okay, it's not just talking about Jews. Every human being is Betzelah. Although that in itself is a discussion. You look at the third chapter of Pirkei Avos, which talks about Chaviv Adam Shenivra Betzelah, and you see a machlokus in the authorities in the, in the in the commentaries as to whether Adam is a reference to only the Jewish people or to. Or to every human being. Okay, so the Gemara now says Mesve. Let's raise a contradiction. It says Venefesh Adam Shishasar Elef. That when you look at the Midianite War in Parshas Matos, it says that the spoils were sixteen thousand Adam, and those were Midianites. So how can you tell me that the word Adam does not refer to non-Jews? The Gemara answer is Mishum Behema. There, since the items that are listed are both human beings and animals, when you want to create a contrast between humans and animals, you can even call a non-Jew an Adam. But that's only when you're contrasting it with animals. But if an Adam, with, when it's not contrasted with an animal in the Pasuk, only refers to a Jew. Asher yesh riba Adam asher lo ben lismolo. Another similar Pasuk is at the end of the book of Yonah where it says <coughs> that God chastising Yonah says, how could, should, shall I not worry about the people of Nineveh? There's over, uh, uh, there's over 120,000 people that don't know the difference between their right and the left. And there they're also called Adam. So again, you see Gentiles are called Adam. The Gemara there says there too, Mishum Behema, because it says, and God says there's also a lot of livestock. So there again, because we're creating a contrast between Behemas and Adams, so we can call the heathen an Adam. Next, kol horeig nefesh v'chol nogea bechalal tishato'u. So let's look at another Pasuk, again, at the Midianite War. It says over there that seemingly Gentiles do transmit Tuma, because it says that anyone who killed a, an enemy combatant, or anyone who's anything that has come in contact with the sword, must be purified. So you see that the casualties on the Midianite side transmit Tuma. So you see that there's Tuma among the Midianites. Dilma iktil chad mi Israel. 
The Gemara says no. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai will tell you that the reason why you have to purify yourselves of coming in contact with death is because maybe there were Jewish casualties. But Gentile casualties do not transmit to them. The Rabbanan The Rabbanan who argue with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai say no. They can only have, the pasuk can only be referring to Gentile casualties because there were no Jewish casualties. It says lonifkat mimenuish that the, no one was uh, no one fell as a casualty. But then the Gemara says Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai lonifkat mimenuish laaveira. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai looks at that pasuk and says no. When that pasuk says that there were no casualties. It doesn't mean that there were no that that, that no one was uh, was killed on the Jewish side. It means that there were no casualties to sin. No one succumbed on the Jewish side to sin. No one did anything lewd or evil on the Jewish side. Now, Ravina Omar nihi dema'atinu kra me'atmuye ba'ohel dechsiv adam ki yamus ba'ohel, but mimago mimasa mima'atinu kra. Ravina says I have a totally different explanation to this last pasuk. Of course, the Pasuk may only be talking about Gentile casualties, but still, the only time that we exclude Gentile corpses from transmitting Tumah is in an enclosure, is in an ohel. But by direct contact, even Gentile corpses transmit Tumah. So therefore, that's the difference. The Pasuk which says, purify yourselves from coming in contact with the dead, is when you directly touch the Gentile corpse. All that Rav Shimon Bar Yochai is suggesting is that if you're in the same ohel as a Gentile corpse, you don't contract tuma, and that is not con- uh, is not contradicted by the pasuk. Let's go weiter. The Mishnah says, "Ires almana benismana lios kohen gadol yichnos." We've seen this halacha before, that if a regular kohen gives kiddushin to an almana to a widow, and then before he has the chance to do nisuin, he's appointed as the kohen gadol. He, the halacha is, is that since he started the process beheter, then he's allowed to finish, he's allowed to consummate, even though the Torah does not allow him to marry an almana, but here, since he already started off the marriage with her, he's allowed to finish. And then the Gemara tells us this actually happened once that Yoshua ben Gamla, who's also cited elsewhere in the Mishnah, in Baba Basra, it says that he gave Kiddushin to a widow by the name of Marta Bas Baitos, who was a very wealthy and influential Jewish woman. And as a result, the king appointed Yoshua ben Gamla as the Kohen Gadol, and yet the rabbis permitted him to finish his marriage, to consummate his marriage with Marta. Now, Shomeris Yavim Shanafu Lifnei Kohen Hejot Venisman Elios Kohen Gadol, Afal Pishos of Amaimer Hareze Lo Yichnos. But by contrast, uh, if you have a woman who's a Shomeris Yavim, which means she's a Yavama, her husband died, and the brother is a Kohen, and he, even if he gives her a Mimer, the halacha is that he's not allowed to consummate the marriage. So the question is, what's the difference between a Kohen who gives the Yavama Mimer and a regular Kohen who gives a regular woman? Uh, who's a widow, Arison. The Gemara will have to explain that for us. The Gemara now says, Tanu Rabbanan, Minayin she'im ires es ha'almana, benismana lios kohen gadol she'yichnos. From where do you know that if the Bryce really just explains the Mishnah, how do you know that if a kohen, regular kohen, gives kiddushin to an almana, and then he's appointed as the kohen gadol, that he's allowed to complete it, he's allowed to consummate, Tamulomar yikach isha. Those two words are extraneous, because the Torah had already told us, told that when you marry a woman, she has to be a virgin. So why does it have to say later on in the next Pasuk, this is how you shall marry a woman? So we learn from those two extra words, that there's an additional woman that he is allowed to marry, even though she's an almana, and that is where he did the Averson previously. So, well, if that's the case, then why don't we let a Yavama? Who's uh, who's gotten a mimer before the guy became a kohen gadol? Why do, or there's certain and there's a zika between the two of them. Why don't we allow him to complete the process? The Gemara answer is isha velo yivama because the pasuk when it says yikach isha, the word isha means a regular single woman. It does not refer to a yivama, and therefore from here we learn that the law that allows a kohen to continue the marriage 
to an almana, since he started it better, does not apply to a yavama. Whether or not this pasuk is an asmachta or whether it's an actual drasha is a little bit unclear to me because conceptually already you understand the difference between a kohen who gives erisin, which is a kiddushin that made the oraisa to an almana, versus a yavam who only gives a maimer or there's only zika to a yavama. There's conceptually a difference anyway. But in any event, we base it on a pasuk. So then we give a story about Yoshua ben Gamla. So Minehu in Nismanalo. It seems like that there's a, 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 a bit of an aberration in the conjugation of the verb to be Monez to a point. So it doesn't say in the Mishnah that he was appointed, but rather it says the king appointed him, which implies that there's something going on over here that it's not that by consensus that he was elected because of his greatness by the people of Israel, but rather the king put him into power. And as a result, Amar of Yosef, Katir Kachazina Hacha. I notice here a conspiracy of wicked people going on over here. The Amar of Asi, Tarkava de Dinri, Ailele Marta Baspaitus, Liane Malka, Adumuki Le Lishuben Gamla Bekohani Ravravi. And actually, that's recorded by Ravasi. He says that Marta, who was very wealthy, gave a chest full of coins to the king in order to have him put Yoshua ben Gamla into place. Now, this means that Yoshua ben Gamla really was not worthy for the Kahuna Gedola, and this was apparently a very common practice during the Second Temple, that you bought your way into positions of greatness. Unfortunately, it still goes on today in certain circles. But what's interesting is that Yoshua ben Gamla was not a really, he was not a bad guy, he was not a wicked person. As a matter of fact, the Mishnah actually attributes to him something truly great that we still have in today. He instituted the entire scholastic system that we have today of yeshivas. Before Yeshua ben Gamla came along, if your child wanted to get an education, his father had to teach him, or he hired a Muhammad. And Yeshua ben Gamla set up yeshivas, he set up schools for children. And that, that's why it says, Zohur Latov, he should be remembered for the good. But yet you see, people are complex. On the one hand, he did something great to institutionalize education for the Jewish people. On the other hand, he bought his way, or had his wife, his wealthy wife, buy his way into the Kahuna Gedola. Let's go weiter. The Mishnah now says, Kohen Gadol Shemes Achiv Choletz Velo Miyabeng. Shemes Achiv Choletz Velo Miyabeng. If a Kohen Gadol's brother passes away and the widow falls to him for Yibum, he can only do Chalitza, he cannot do Yibum because this woman is an Almana. So he's not allowed to do Yibum. So the Gemara now says, Kapasik Vitani Lo Shnamin HaErisen Velo Shnamin HaNesuin. The Gemara says something very interesting. There's no distinction made in the Brisa whether the widow was a widow from Erisin or from Nisuin whether this was a, mar- a full marriage or whether there was only an Arison marriage, in either way, the Kohen Gadol is not allowed to do Yibam. So the, this, this leads the Gemara to ask the following question. Bishlam amin anesuin, ase velo sase hu, ve'en ase doicha lo sase va'ase. Ele min ha'erison, yavo ase v'yidches lo sase. The Gemara says, I, I can certainly understand when she was a full wife, when she was a Nesua, I can understand why the Kohen Gadol can't do the mitzvah of Yibam, because the prohibition of a Kohen marrying a, marri- a woman who was previously married and is no longer a virgin involves b- the violation of both a mitzvah's ase and a mitzvah's lo sase. The mitzvah's ase, the Torah says, V'hu isha vivsu yikach. You must marry a woman who's a virgin. And then the Torah says, Almana lo yikach, that you're not allowed to marry an almana. That's the mitzvah's lo sase. And we know that, Ein ase docha lo sase va'ase. That we know that a positive commandment cannot override a both a positive and a negative commandment together. That we learned at the very beginning of Yuvamos. But the question is, what if this woman is still a virgin? Because she only had Arison from the deceased brother. In that case, there's no violation of a mitzvah's ase for the Kohen Gadol to marry her because she is a virgin. There's only the violation of a mitzvah's los ase that she's an almana. Why don't we say the standard halacha of ase doichalos ase? Let him consummate the mitzvah of yibum with her. The Gemara answer is zera be a rishana ought to be a shnia. The answer is like we saw in the first parak that the rabbi stepped in and said don't, because you fulfill the mitzvah ase of yibum by just having one bia with this woman. So therefore, the rabbi said, well, if we're going to allow you to have one bia with her, one act of consummation, you may not be able to control yourself and divorce her at that point. 
and we're worried that you may consummate a second time, which would be a, a violation. You would not have the Asi Docha Los Asi. And therefore the rabbi stepped in and they said, you can't do it at all. Shev al So now it's his wife. It's like he married any other woman. Once he has Bia, she's not a virgin anymore. So now she's a wife. She's allowed to continue... Well, that's a good argument. If he did the first time, if right. he did beheter, right. and then why don't we just say let him let him keep her? So apparently, it's a very good question. The Gemara only holds that way when you had a complete heter to marry her, not because of an ase doy chalos ase situation. In other words, the, when we say ase doy chalos ase, it does mean that the los ase is non-existent. It's still there conceptually. And therefore, if once you've dispensed with the mitzvah sase, the lo sase comes back with full intensity, just like a coin who's married to a grusha, right? So that's why we can't allow it. In our previous cases, the first act of, uh, of bia was completely permissible because uh, he was a coin hedgeot, he wasn't a coin gadol yet. Okay. Let's go on to the next Mishnah. Kohen hedjot lo yisa ailenis, eli imkein yesh lo isha uvanim. A regular Kohen is not allowed to marry an ailenis, which is a woman who is infertile, unless he already has a wife and children. And the way that the, the Meforshim explain is, it's not that he has to have a wife and children. As long as he's already been married and he's had children from another wife, then he's allowed to take a second wife, even if his first wife is currently deceased or divorced, he can take a second wife who's infertile. Why? Because he's already fulfilled the mitzvah of pru or vu. Now, you notice here that the Mishnah is talking about a Kohen. Why only a Kohen? This should apply to everybody. We'll talk about that in a minute. Reb Yehuda Omer, Afal pishi yesh lo isha ubanim, lo yisa ailenes shehizona ha'amura b'Torah. Now, Reb Yehuda comes along and he says, no. When it comes to a Kohen, even if he already has a wife and children, he's already fulfilled the mitzvah of Pruervu, he's not allowed to marry an islandess because an islandess has a din of a zoina. Now, that's a pretty st- harsh thing to say. Nice young lady, what, just because she's infertile makes her into a zona? That a Kohen is not allowed to marry? So we have to understand, Rabbi Yehuda, why does he say that? V'chachomim omrim, ein zona elegioris umeshuchreres v'shenivala be'ila zunos. And the Chachamim disagree, and they say, no, it's perfectly fine for a Kohen to marry an islandess. She does not qualify as a Zona. The only time you have a Zona is a woman who's a convert or a freed slave. And the reason is, is because we assume that she's had relations in the past with a non-Jewish man. Relations with a non-Jewish man renders a woman a Zona. Or if she's had any illicit relationship with a Jewish man, that will also render her a Zona. It's a machlokas between Rashi and Tosfus, as to the, the level of illicitness that would cause her to be defined as a zona. Rashi says, anytime there's a mitzvah slosase, like a kohen to a grusha, that renders her a zona and a chalala, right? But Tosfus says, no, the, the term zona only refers to a woman who had a relationship with a man where there's an iser kares involved. Only that is woman is precluded from marrying a kohen. Okay, but we'll talk about that another time. Let's go on now to the Gemara. question mark. So the Reish Galusa asked Rav Huna a very simple question. What's the reason why a, a Kohen is not allowed to marry an islandess if he hasn't yet fulfilled the mitzvah pru or vu because he has to, uh, he has to procreate? So, so the question is, what, only a Kohen has a mitzvah to procreate and not, uh, uh, not a Yisrael? Why does the Mishnah only talk about a Kohen? So the Gemara answers, Amar leh mishum de kaboy le misni seifa, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, afal pishi yesh lo isha, bi yesh lo banan lo yisa ailen es shihizona hamura b'tora, da azona kohanim u de mifkidi vi Yisrael lo mifkidi, mishum hachi ketani Kohen. The Gemara answer is very simple. We want to create a, a contrast to Rebbe Yehuda in the Seifa. Rebbe Yehuda says that even if you've already fulfilled the mitzvah of Pru Vu, if you're a Kohen, you're not allowed to marry an islandess because she's a Zona. So therefore, that halacha only applies to Kohanim, because the Yisrael is allowed to marry a Zona. So since Rebbe Yehuda, who argues with the Tanakama, is talking about an Isra specifically to a Kohen, who's not allowed to marry an islandess, that's why the Reisha talked about the issue of islandess vis-a-vis a Kohen, but really applies to Yisrael as well. That what the Mishnah is saying is that either for a Yisrael or a Kohen, in order to fulfill the mitzvah of Pru or Vu, you're not allowed to marry an islandess. 
But once you fulfill the mitzvah of pruervu, you can marry an islandess. Comes along Rabbi Yehuda and says, no, a Kohen is not allowed to marry an islandess because she qualifies as a zona. So, Amar of Huna, my time at the Rebbe Yehuda. So let, let's try and understand, why does Rebbe Yehuda say that this nice uh, young lady who's never been with a man before, it can still be called a zona? Because it says in Hosea, they eat without being satisfied, they perform lewd acts, and they do not propagate or spread out. And what we see from that pasuk is kolbia she'ein ba peritza eina ela be'ilas nus. That what does the pasuk describe as a lewd act of intimacy? Any act which does not have the ability to result in procreation. Meaning that what you see from here is is that having bia with an islandess when you know that there's no possibility of her conceiving is considered to be a lewd act. And that's by, why, by definition, she's called a zona, according to Rebbe Yehuda. She's a woman with whom you commit a lewd act. Right? It's not that she's done anything bad. Right? She could be a virgin right now, but she's still called a zona because if you have relations with her, you've committed an act of lewdness. That will virtually occur in every couple's life at some point where there's a, a time where they can have Correct. relations and yet... So as long as, when, as long as when you married her, she was capable of procreation, then even though she becomes menopausal at some time later, it's permitted to continue with her. Uh, and also when a woman's <coughs> pregnant, she's not capable of <coughs> conceiving <coughs> further. And yet... Right, and yet that that's not considered to be an islandess who's completely infertile will never be able to have children. Tanya, Rebbe Eliezer, Omer, Kohen, Lo Yisa, Esakitana. Now there's a brisa that's very cryptic. It's a one-line brisa that says, according to Rebbe Eliezer, a Kohen is not allowed to marry a girl who's a minor if she's under the age of 12. So Amalei Rebchis de Laraba Puk Ayinba de Laurta Boy La Ravuna Minach. So Rav Chizda says to Rabbah, listen, do me a favor, Rabbah, you better analyze and try to understand this mission, this b'risa that Rabbi Eliezer, of Rabbi Eliezer that says that a Kohen cannot marry a Kitana because tonight when Rav Huna is going to speak to you, he's going to ask you what's the taich in this b'risa. You're going to... You, joked she could marry it after three years. I know, yeah. but this is Rabbi Eliezer's opinion who says that he, a Kohen cannot marry a Kitana. So the question is, why? You try and figure out, why does Rabbi Eliezer say this? So Nafak Ayin Ba, so that's what Rabbi did. He went and he, he examined this, he tried to analyze it, and he came up with the following conclusion. Rabbi Eliezer, Savrla ke Rabbi Meir, Vesavrla ke Rabbi Yehuda. That Rabbi Eliezer, in this b'risa, is holding like two other tanoim, like Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda. Savrla ke Rabbi Meir, Dechayesh Lemiuta. The way it works is like this. Rabbi Eliezer is of the opinion that a Kohen is not allowed to marry an islandess because she's a zona. So he agrees with Rabbi Yehuda. Now, what does that have to do with marrying a minor? Now, what is an islandess? An islandess is a woman who does never dis- develops physically to show that her hormones are working properly, and as a result, she's also not allowed to, able, able to conceive. When a girl is under the age of 12, you can't tell what's going, how she's going to develop uh, uh, hormonally. And as a result, since you don't know, maybe she'll grow up to be an islandess, according to Reb Meir, who says that you have to worry about any person being part of a minority, therefore you can't marry this girl. You see, Reb Meir is, is, is disputed by the Chachamim. The Chachamim say that even though I have no evidence of what your status is now, I can assume you're part of the, of the majority. But Rabbi Meir says, no, if you have no evidence, you have to be machmir, because maybe you're, this person is part of the minority. And therefore, he must hold like Rabbi Meir, who says that you're that this person is part of the minority, that maybe she'll grow up to be an islandess. And then since an islandess is a zona, that's why a, a Kohen cannot marry a Kitana. So the Gemara now challenges this. It says, Rabbi Meir mi Since when does... Rabbi Eliezer hold like Reb Meir, the Hatanya Katanu Kitana Lacholson Velo Binyabim and Divir Reb Meir, that they look at the following Brisa. The Brisa says that both a Katan and a Katana, whether the Yavam is a minor or whether the Yavama is a minor, they're not allowed to have Chalitza, nor are they allowed to have Yibo. 
So Amr Lola Rebbe Meir Yafe Amarta Shein Cholzin Ish Ksiv Beparsha Umakshinon Ish Le Ish. So the rabbis respond to Rebbe Meir and they say, "We certainly agree with you when it comes to chalitza. That you, the Torah says that an Ish." is capable of doing chalitza, and an ish, by definition, is an adult. So certainly, when the yavam is a minor, he can't do chalitza. And we also scripturally connect an adult male to the adult female, and therefore she also has to be an adult in order to receive chalitza. That is perfectly reasonable, Rebbe Meir. Ella, my taima ein miyabimin. But why do you also insist that a minor cannot do yibum to a minor girl? Why not let them go ahead and start it off, and they'll finish it when they and they'll be husband and wife when they are adults. So Amarlei katan shema yimotze srisk tana shema timotze ailanis v'nim pogin be'erva. So Rabbi Meir's response was because we don't know whether this this minor boy or this minor girl is really fulfilling the mitzvah of yibum. Because if the boy Taka turns out to be a eunuch and he's not capable of procreating, or the girl turns out to be an islandess, an infertile woman. Then, then it turns out that there's no mitzvah for them to do yibum, and in which case their intimacy was with an eshesach shalob b'makom mitzvah when there's no mitzvah of yibum, and then it turns out that they're having intimacy with an erva. That's what Reb Meir was worried about. The Tanya, but now we have another brisa that says ketana misyabemes ve'ena cholatzis divi Rebbe Eliezer, and Rebbe Eliezer holds that a ketana, a minor girl, is allowed to do yibum. So you see very clearly that he doesn't hold that you have to worry about her being part of a miyot, being an islandess, growing up to be an islandess, because he allows her to do yibum. He agrees that she can't do chalitza, because for chalitza you need das, you need to have cognizance of an adult. And therefore he agrees that you can't do chalitza, but he very clearly holds that you are allowed to do yibum as a katana. So therefore you see that he's not chayshesh lemiyuta, he's not worried that she's part of this minority islandess population. Number two, that's why I've just shown you that he doesn't hold like Reb Meir. I'll also show you that he doesn't hold like Reb Yehuda, that an islandess is a zona. Because Misavrla Hatanya, look at the following Brisa. Zona, zona, kishma, divir Rebbe Eliezer. The Rebbe Eliezer says that what is the definition of a zona? A woman who strays. Now, what is the definition of a woman who strays? She strays from her owner or from her husband, so to speak. Meaning, that any woman who commits adultery is a zona, but any other woman is not a zona. And Rabbi Akiva Omer Zona Zumuf Keres, Rabbi Akiva's definition of a zona is any woman who has multiple uh, partners, that's what's called a zona, even if she's not married. And Rabbi Masya ben Kharish Omer Afil Holach Balala Hashkosa Ubole Abader Chasa Azona. Rabbi Masya ben Kharish says any woman who has an illicit relationship is called a zona, and it's sometimes possible, even with her own husband, to have an illicit relationship if the husband suspects her of, of being adulter- an adulteress and he's on his way to take her to the Kohen. If at that point he has an illicit, he has a, a intimacy with her, he made her into a zona because once you suspect your wife of adultery, you're not allowed to live with her. So that would also make her into a zona. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Zaina Zu Islandis. And Rabbi Yehuda says that the definition of a zayin is an islandess. So clearly you see within this very brice that Rabbi Eliezer has one definition of zona, Rabbi Yehuda has a different definition of zona to say that an islandess is a zona. And v'chachamim omrim ein zona elegioros u'meshucheros v'shuniv alo be'ilazunos. The chachamim have another shita, and they say that the definition of a zona is any woman who had relations with a goy, even if she was a non-Jew at the time, or if she has any kind of what's called bi'ilasinus, any kind of illicit relationship, again, what that the, the definition of that illicit relationship is the Machlokas Rashi and Taisvis. And Rebbe Elazar Omer, Panoi Habala Panuya Shalulashemishusazona. He has the most Machmir Shita. He says that any time a single boy, any time a, a girl has an extramarital encounter with a man, that makes her into a zona because it was outside the context of marriage. But the bottom line is, is that the reason why we quote this whole Bryce is to demonstrate that Rabbi Eliezer's definition of zona is totally different from Rabbi Yehuda's definition of zona. So how can you tell me that Rabbi Eliezer in this Bryce holds like Rabbi Yehuda and holds like Rabbi Meir as his basis for saying that a Kohen cannot marry a Kitana? So Ela Omar of Ada Bar Ahavahacha Bekoin Gadol Askinan Leimas Kani La Lechigad La Beulahi. And so Ravada Barahava says, I have a different explanation of the Brisa. When Rabbi Eliezer says that a Kohen can't marry a Kitani, he's talking about only a Kohen Gadol. 
And the reason a Kohen Gadol cannot marry a Kitana is because they're only biblically married once she becomes an adult. By the time she becomes an adult, and that they're therefore now biblically married, she's already no longer a virgin. And since she, at the time of the real biblical marriage, she's not a virgin, he's not allowed to marry her even as a Kitana, because he's, he's, he's causing her to be uh, to enter into a marriage which is going to be prohibited at some point in the future. So Amar Rava, Michali Leif. Rava says, I'm sorry, but that statement of Ravada Bar Ava was said without paying attention. In other words, it was not said with a fully engaged mind. And why? Because I de Kiddisha Avua Meahi Shaituhu de Kanila, the I de Kiddisha Nafsha, Harebi Eliezer, he velo Rabbanan. He says, because no matter how you look at it, that doesn't make any sense what Ravada Bar Ava was saying. He says, look, if a girl has a father, then what's the mechanism of Kiddushin for a minor? The father accepts the kes of Kiddushin for his daughter, and she is fully, biblically, legally married to that man. So don't tell me that the real biblical Kiddushin doesn't take place until she becomes an adult. Halachically, their husband and wife, even Midioraisa, so from the time that the father accepts the kes of Kiddushin. So there is no problem of her being a, vir- a non-virgin by the time they're married. And number two, if you're talking about a girl who doesn't have a father, and therefore there's only a rabbinical marriage possible, then why does, is Rebbe, why does only Rebbe Eliezer say that he's not allowed to marry her if we're talking about a Kohen Gadol to this Kitana who doesn't have a father? What, the Chachamim are going to disagree with that? Why this is only going according to Rebbe Eliezer? So therefore, I have a problem with your interpretation, Rav Adabar Ahaba, because no matter how you look at it, it seems that this explanation doesn't work for this Brisa. So the Gemara says, Ela Amar Rav, Ela Olam Bekoin Hejot, V'chayshin and Shem Etispate Alav. So Rav says, really we're talking about, we're going to go back to our original explanation. Really the Brisa, which with Rebbe Eliezer, is talking about a regular Kohen. Why is a regular Kohen not allowed to marry a minor? Because we're worried that his minor wife will be seduced by a guy walking while she's walking down the street one day. A guy will seduce her, and she'll have an affair with him. And the Kohen, we know, is not allowed to be with a wife, with a wife who commits adultery. So, Ihachi Yisrael Nami, so then why only a Kohen? Let any man not be allowed to marry a Katana, lest she be seduced by another man. The Gemara answers, Petuye Katana Onesu, the Ones be Yisrael Mishri Shari. The Gemara says very simple that the seduction of a minor is called rape. Even today in common law, we call that statutory rape. What is statutory rape? Where a girl gives her consent, but she's not of the age of consent. She doesn't have enough maturity to know what she is consenting to. And that's why it's called statutory rape. So when a Yisrael's wife is statutorily raped, he's permitted to stay with her because a a, a rape victim is allowed to go back to her husband. But a rape victim is not allowed to go back to her Kohen husband. Even when if a Kohen's wife, even if she's raped, she's not permitted to go back to her husband. And that's why a Kohen cannot marry a Katana, because she may be statutorily raped by seduction, and then she won't be permitted to go back to her husband. That's our concern. So Rav Papa Omar be Kohen Gadol v'haitanahu. So Rav Papa says, no, I have a different taich. I hold that Rabbi Eliezer's Bryce is talking about a Kohen Gadol. Back to what we were saying before, that a Kohen Gadol is not allowed to marry a Katana because he goes like the following Tana, the Tanya Besula Yachal Katana Tamal Omer Isha, I Isha Yachal Bogeres Tamal Omer Besula. So we have the Torah, when it talks about who the Kohen Gadol is allowed to marry, it says, Isha Visula. It says that a, uh, he can only marry a woman who's a virgin. Now, what is the definition of uh, Besula? You might think it refers to a Kitana. It doesn't. It only refers to an Isha, because the word Isha means an adult. But if you mean that he's got to marry her only as an adult, meaning that she's a Bogaris, she's over the age of 12 and a half, so then you might think that uh, she doesn't have to be uh, Besula, because remember we learned before that once a woman becomes a Bogaris, her membrane becomes thinned out, and she's therefore not a full Besula anymore. So how do we reconcile? The, on the one hand it says Isha, on the other hand it says Besula. So how do you rec- reconcile the two? Therefore, based on this Pasuk, we say that you can only marry a girl between the age of 12 and 12 and a half. She's no longer a Kitana, and she's not yet a Bogaris. So this is it's based on the Psukim, that according to Rabbi Eliezer, 
a Kohen may not marry a Kitana. It sort of narrows the window of who a Kohen Gadol is allowed to marry. Wouldn't you say he's got to be between the age of 12 and 12 and a half? Now remember, we learned before that a Kohen is only allowed to marry a Kitana or a Nara. Rabbi Eliezer disagrees and he says, no, he's only allowed to marry a Nara. And Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Amar Haitana Hudetanya, he says it's this brisa, meaning that the brisa, this following brisa, bears the same idea. Besula ein besula elanara v'chein hu omer v'hanara to basmar ema od besula, that the word besula by definition refers to a naara between the age of twelve and twelve and a half, because we find this by Rivka. It says that it says about Rivka that she was a naara, very attractive. And she was a besula. So you see the word besula and nara go together. Now here you have a long discussion in Tosfus, who asks, how old was Rivka when this event took place? From this Gemara, it seems like she was 12 years old. But we also know that there's a medrash that says that she was three, three years old. No, everyone knows that medrash. Why does everyone know that medrash? Because it's very striking. Because Yitzchak is 40 and Rivka is 3. So people always scratch their head and say, how could such a thing be? So you have to realize there's two other versions. One is this, Gemara, who says that she was 12. There's another Medrash that says that she was 14. So Tosva says you have to conclude that there's a machlokis among the Midrashim. And to be honest with you, I always prefer the Medrash version that says that she was either 12 or 14 because it's very difficult to imagine a three-year-old being able to do all those things at the well that are described about her that she did, right? So anyway, but it, so th- that's how I know that a Kohen Gadol is only allowed to marry a Na'ara and not a Katana, because the word Besula always means a Na'ara. Rebbe Lazar Omer, So let's go back to what we saw from Rebbe Lazar. Rebbe Lazar says that a single man... Uh, uh, who has a relationship with a single woman outside the context of marriage. And like Tysus points out, <coughs> it's Lav Davka, a single man. Any man who has a relationship with a single woman, but it's extramarital, it's not outside the context of marriage, renders her a zona. So, Amar of Amram, Ein Halacha Karebi Elazar. So, this Rebbe Elazar, we don't paskin like. So, remember, there's a difference between Rebbe Eliezer and Rebbe Elazar. Rebbe Eliezer is the one who says that um, a Kohen is not allowed to marry a Katana. And Rebbe Elazar over here says, no, the definition of a Zona is any woman who's had an extramarital relationship. And again, this has very practical ramifications in Halacha, because a Kohen, even today, has to be careful about who he marries. He's not allowed to marry a Zona. We paskin that the definition of a Zona is any woman who's had an illicit sexual encounter or an encounter with a Goy. So, um, for balas tshuva, if a woman, if a girl's a balas tshuva and she wants to marry a, a kohen, as long she doesn't have to be a virgin, but she 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 can't ever have had intimacy with a non-Jew. So this is you know it's important to know because a lot of times you have a balas tshuva, she becomes from, but she lived in a university and in a sorority or whatever it was, and uh, it, she may have uh, been. Uh, uh, living a lifestyle just like most people in society live today, which is to have partners before marriage. But as long as they were all Jewish, she's still allowed to marry a Kohen. She just can't marry a Kohen if one of her partners was a non-Jew. Let's go, we have to, we don't have time, let's go on to the next Mishnah. This is a very famous Mishnah. <laughs> that a man may not abstain from the mitzvah of pru or vu unless he already has children. Beishamai Omrim Shnei Zuchar. Beishamai say, how many children does he have to have? Two, two sons. O Beisil Omrim Zuchar and Akeva. Beisil says a son and a daughter. Shneim are Zuchar and Akeva Biraam. Because after all, the Torah says that God created Adam, male and female. So once you fulfill the mitzvah of male and female, you fulfill the mitzvah of procreation. You've actually imitated the act of creation. The Gemara now says, "Ha yesh lo banim mipriya urviya batel meisha lo batel." The Gemara makes a diuk. It says the very fact that it says that you may not abstain from the mitzvah of pru or vu implies that once you have have abstained from the mitzvah of pru or vu, you're no longer obligated to still pro- procreate. But it sounds like you still have to be married to a woman. In other words, the Mishnah has only exempted you from having kids, but it has not exempted you from having a wife. This supports Rav Nachman, who says that, in the name of Shmuel, that no matter how many children a person has, he may not live without a wife. 
you know, we find this, even great holy people, if they're not married, you never know what can happen. So that's the thing, is that a man is not anchored to anything solid unless he's got a woman in his life to keep him real, as they say, right? Shenamar lotobe yosa adam levado. As it says, it is not good for man to be alone. So that's why it's this, you know, you have to, that's, that's why they say, they say it in jest. They say after, if a man becomes widowed, they say, um, but if during Shiva, it's too early to read a shidduch. By the Shloshim, it's already too late. In other words, you have to get moving on this. You have to make sure that a man does not live for any extended period of time without a wife because he's not anchored in something real. Okay, the Ika Da'amri, others learn, Others learn that the initial inference was made that it sounds like from our Mishnah that as long as you fulfill the mitzvah of Pruurvu, you're completely off the hook. You don't have to procreate, nor do you have to have a wife. Is this perhaps then a contradiction to what Shmuel says that a man always has to be married? Lo, ain lo bonim no se isha bas bonim, yesh lo bonim no se isha lav bas bonim. That no, really the Mishnah is not contradicting that because really all the Mishnah is saying is that if you already have children, if you don't yet have children, you have to marry a woman who can bear you children. If you don't have, if you've already had children, you fulfill the mitzvah of Pruurvu, then you can marry a woman who doesn't have the ability to bear you children, but you still have to be married. And nafgamina lim korsefer Torah bishvil banim. And according to both versions, this way Tosfos learns that what is the practical ramification of this statement, other than there's a financial ramification as well. We know that you're not allowed to sell a sefer Torah unless there's a pressing halachic need. So what is considered a pressing halachic need? If a man has not yet fulfilled the mitzvah of pruurvu, he's allowed to sell a sefer Torah in order to pay for a, the, the ability to marry a woman. Let's say he's got to pay for her to come over to his country, right? So you can sell a sefer Torah in order to afford to order your wife, you know, like a, ma- a mail-order bride. <laughs> in order to get a bride to come to you, you can sell a sefer Torah for whatever the price is. But if you've already, fu- already fulfilled the mitzvah of pruurvu, then you're not allowed to sell a Sefer Torah to do your mail-order bride who's like in her 20s if there's a woman right here who's in her 50s that's perfectly good to marry, just that she can't bear you children. So you can't say, well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'd rather marry the 20-year-old girl instead of marrying the 50-year-old. Sorry. We don't let you sell a Sefer Torah for that because you've already fulfilled the mitzvah. So that's a halachic nafkamina that has, uh, applies to, that has halachic applications as far as financial issues. Beishamai Omrim Shnei Zacharim said, Beishamai now say, we'll conclude with this. Beishamai say, the mitzvah of Pruurvu is fulfilled with two males. So, Mai Tamayad to Beishamai, what's their reasoning? Yalfinon mi Moshe, Dixiv bnei Moshe, Gershom ve Eliezer. That Moshe had two sons, Gershom and Eliezer, and as soon as he had two sons, he permanently separated from his wife. So, if he hadn't yet fulfilled the mitzvah of Pruurvu, what right would he have to separate from his wife? Ubeisil Yalfinon mi Briyaso shal Olam. And Basil, of course, as we saw in the Mishnah, they learned from the act of creation. God creates man, male, and female. And since every person is supposed to be godlike in his creative power, he's also got to have a male and a female. Why doesn't Beishamai agree to Basil? The Gemara answer is, The answer is very simple. Beishamai say, when God created the world, he needed to create a male and female because that was the only way that there could ever be procreation. But after you've been living a few centuries into creation where there are hundreds of available females, you don't necessarily see that that's, um, that that's necessarily the criterion. In other words, there at the time of creation, it was necessary. Here, it's not absolutely necessary, and therefore you can't necessarily learn a case where it's absolutely necessary in a case to a case and apply it to a case where it's not necessary. A man could say, I have two sons, they can easily procreate by finding girls outside of the mishpacha. So therefore, just having, there's no need for me to have a male and a female. They can marry a female from another family. Why doesn't Basila learn from Moshe? The answer is Moshe Rabbeinu made a discernment that he was a unique situation that did not apply to the rest of the human population. Why did he have to separate from Tzipporah? Because he was going to be visited by the Shekhinah regularly. 
And this is not something that applies to any other human being other than Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu is the exception, but everyone else has to continue engaging in procreation until they have a male and a female. And of course, this is the mistake that the Catholic Church has made, is that they learn from Moshe that abstaining from marriage is a, is, a, is a virtuous thing because you see that Moses did it and of course the Catholic Church has been proven to be uh, mistaken in this project uh, uh, time and time again, unfortunately you see that when you're not married, like the Gemara says when you're not married, anything, crazy things can happen, so this Gemara is certainly borne out by the human experience, have a wonderful day